Okay, good morning. Um, bring that closer. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, ten minutes is not a lot of time, as most people have found out so far. So I'm going to whiz. I'm going to whiz through this really quickly. This is basically a whole bunch of thoughts uh, from the work that I've done over the last sort of 15, 16 years and the last six years in mobile, and it will be quick. So it's now what 10:57. Okay. So um, I'm thinking about tools that travel, not necessarily people that travel. How you build tools that actually will move into different environments and work in different environments. Um, my background, very quickly, 25 years or so in IT, the last 15, 16 years doing a lot of work in uh, about nine or 10 African countries. Uh, my degree, social anthropology, and since 2003, I've been working specifically to try and figure out how you get mobile technology to work in places like this. You know, you have NGOs who are serving underserved communities, and they're working in pretty harsh places, and a lot of the technologies that were coming out or that I was seeing just wouldn't work in those places. Um, so I guess that's probably the best picture I could find that I've taken of what it might look like for them to be on the margins. Um, the first bit of work I did originally, uh, 2003, 2004, was with Kruger National Parks. And they were seeing increasing numbers of cell phones appearing in the hands of these, these type of people. These women live in a community on the edge of the National Park and they're largely excluded from the conservation process or benefiting in any way from the conservation process. And they were thinking, how do we re-engage them after 80 or 90 years of never speaking to them? Um, and how, how do you do it through cell phones? And I, I was tasked to try and find something they could use in that kind of environment. And we couldn't find anything that really worked for a, a whole bunch of reasons. And it got me thinking. And I'll explain in a couple of minutes what the, the reasons why I think the, the, the tools we found didn't work. But I think generally for me, a lot of it comes down to this centralized v sort of decentralized argument. Everyone's excited about the cloud and connecting to things. But connecting to things in those kind of environments is pretty tough. Generally speaking, it, SMS will get you there maybe if there's a mobile signal. But beyond that, if you go beyond that, you, you exclude so many people that you have to start wondering why you're doing what you're doing. And um, we have this sort of traditional way, I think, of thinking about how we connect people. We have the internet in the middle. And I um, make apologies for using Microsoft's logo there in the middle. But we have the internet. And then we have all the sort of communities. And we think about how do we connect them to that E? How do we share information in a central point and let, give them access to it? We don't always really think about what it was or what it is they might want to access. That's a different argument altogether. But um, that's kind of the model we follow. And for me, there's a lot of content within the communities that actually needs to be shared. We don't really think of communities always as being content generators. We just think they, they just need to suck up information. And how do we allow communities to share the information they possess with other members of their community and nearby communities. And if you do that, you don't need to connect to the middle. Obviously, ideally, perhaps, you could argue that you do, but there's plenty you can do if you just connect people within those little, little sections. Um, a quick story about elephants. Um, one of the projects I've worked on has been trying to give early warning to elephants encroaching on villages. And when I was walking around and meeting villagers, and they were thinking, you know, why are the national parks trying to find a way of inf giving information to us about elephants arriving? because we're usually the first to know. We're out in our fields and we see the elephants. The National Parks Authorities in Nairobi or Johannesburg, how are they, you know, so why don't we have the tools to spread that information among ourselves? And it kind of, again, it got me thinking about how we were going about trying to solve some of these problems. Um, most of the NGOs I've worked with and most of the NGOs who come to me and I try to help um, generally fall into this, um, these sort of categories. And they're small, very dedicated, highly efficient with their money, and I've seen education centers in Nigeria built with just $200. Um, and I see fundraising attempts trying to raise tens of thousands to do similar things. And I kind of wonder how many stories that building is going to have and whether it will have under, underground parking and all sorts of crazy stuff. But you can do really, really good things with small amounts of money. And grassroots NGOs seem to be able to figure out how to do that. Um, I think that thinking about how we build tools that they can use in those environments, there's a few things they need to meet. Um, I think, first of all, they have to work on readily available hardware. They can't go shopping for a top-of-the-range server. They can't go shopping for an iPhone, necessarily, if you're thinking really on the margins. They need to be quick to put together. They don't want to spend hours and days and weeks figuring out how this thing plugs in and does stuff. It needs to be cheap or free, ideally free. It needs to be replicable as well. How does one NGO tell another NGO what they're doing, and how does that NGO then very, very quickly adopt that technology? So if it's not replicable, then you know, we're kind of getting ourselves stuck in a bit of a hole, I think. We need to think about going beyond building one solution for one organization in one country and not think about how that can be spread to other organizations doing similar work. Also, forget the internet, in my view. If it needs to connect to the internet, then I don't generally do anything that needs to connect to the internet. 
We do stuff that will if it's available, but it's not a showstopper. And finally, when they can get on the internet, how do they connect up and join communities with other users to figure out what other people are doing? And it kind of gets them a little bit away from their um, on the margins and takes them slightly more central where they can read about other things and try and re-engage and engage with, with other people doing similar work. Um, but today I'm not actually out here, I'm here. And I wanted to very quickly just go through a few things that, that I found um, over the last couple of years in particular. There are huge numbers of people trying to build tools and solutions for developing countries and not all in institutions like Georgia Tech or MIT. There are a lot of people out there, hobbyists and people who are just generally very, very interested in solving problems that they see. And often they're sort of falling into traps. When I came here, I thought I'd just talk about this. This is some software I developed, which actually works in places like the communities around Kruger National Park. It's just an SMS messaging hub, which allows you to do group two-way messaging through the mobile phone signal. It doesn't require the internet. I decided, though, that thinking about the community here and what we're talking about here, it'd be better off to talk about some of the things which I often talk to people about. I'll be amazed, and I continue to be amazed, how many people try to fix a problem they've got no understanding of. Um, and I think Aaron mentioned it this morning. And it still happens. Why is some white guy in, in Massachusetts trying to solve a problem in a rural village he's never been to and never spoken to anybody there? I mean, it's great, good intentions, but I think we need to really think about that. Also, be flexible. You know, don't, don't try and make sure it's all perfect before you do something with it. You know, be, be flexible so in changing environments you can actually adapt what you're looking to do. Um, again, Think about building things which are easy to use, don't require training. Users can't fly off to the capital city for a week and get training. They really need to be able to figure it out for themselves. And the act of discovery also buys you in local engagement and empowerment. If a user figures something out, if it's not too hard, they feel amazingly empowered. And certainly with the software I've developed, many users start to do things with it they never imagined. And then the, the engagement and the empowerment and the buy-in is already there. So let's not put everything on a plate. Let's, let's give the users a little bit of work to do but not too much. Um, think about rapid prototyping. Again, if, if, if you do a rapid prototype of something and you throw it out and nobody's interested, that's, that's a message. You know? It's like, don't do any more. You know? why, are you, why are you bothering to do this? So do an early iteration, throw it out, see what happens, and then evolve around the response you get from people. And be patient as well. Things don't happen overnight. Um, don't be too controlling. You know, I think in the work I do, I, I give a tool away and I step back and I have very little to do with anything beyond that point. And it's kind of a little bit scary doing that because you lose total contact with people and you, you, you lose a sense of what it's doing half the time. But if you try and control it, you're sort of almost strangling it at birth. And the last one on these, um, just ensure that it works, as I've mentioned, on readily available hardware. And just make sure that people can get the bits they need relatively easily to make what you're building work. I think that's, that's really important. These are all on the blog post, by the way. There's, a, there's about 22 of these, and I'm happy to give you the link, the link a bit later. Um, a final section, um, some of the myths that really bug me. Um, and I've blogged about this as well. This whole thing, the scale, one of the mis most misused words, I think, in ICT4D, uh, means so many things to so many people. It's almost like uh, the word appropriate technology. No one really knows what it means, but it sounds good. Um, and I think we need to think about scale in different ways. Think about horizontally scaling things, not taking something which runs quite nicely in a small environment and then sticking it on a big fat server, because that then changes the DNA of the solution completely, and what you originally had can be destroyed and lost. Big is beautiful. Again, it's, it's, I think it's not. I see no problem in having 10,000 small health hubs running services for local people, which may be connected or maybe not connected. I'd rather see that than some very large, big, fat thing sitting at the Ministry of Health where there's no local engagement and ownership. And then finally, on these, the old argument that appropriate technologies are poor people's technologies. I, I studied appropriate technology at university and got very, very interested in it. And I, I, I carry a lot of the themes through in my work today, and I think you still see this. Well, why are you giving them this low-end stuff? Why are you giving them netbooks and OLPCs? You know, why don't you just give them the really cool things? So um, those are the sort of some of the little snapshots of the things that I've learned, and I try and share with people who contact me who are trying to develop things in this space. And just finally, again, I think when we go to bed at night, we just need to think, have I really advanced anything today which gets us any closer to helping people like this? You know, am I doing something of value? Am I doing it for me or am I doing it for them? And, and I constantly challenge myself to think, are we, in the work that I do, getting closer to producing tools which can travel in these marginal areas and service communities on the edges of parks like Kruger National Park? So that was 10 minutes, I think. Thank you. <laughs>